Welcome to Sri Lankan Understanding, a platform on which we explore the past, present and potential for the future of Sri Lanka, an island in the Indian Ocean. Our topic for discussion today is the functioning of the legal sector in the new normal amidst the pandemic as it unfolds in here, right here in Sri Lanka and across the world. Our guest today is a member of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. He is also the chairman of the Beyond the Chambers Initiative and a member of the Subcommittee on Continuing Legal Education. Thank you very much, Shelag Nilgiriya, for joining us today. We're going to be focusing on the legal sector, how it is functioning, what is happening, how it is adapting to the new normal, if we can call it the new normal, that is. What were some of the main challenges that the legal sector faced as a result of the pandemic? Thank you, George, for having me today. Well, as you know, the emergence of COVID-19 pandemic was an unprecedented global phenomenon that none of us had experienced before. Now, from compelling us to wear face masks whenever we go in public, uh, it brought about many other drastic changes, not only to our lives, but al also to our livelihoods and lifestyle as well. Uh, there's this instance I recall where the former US President Barack Obama uh, in a recent media interview stating, and I quote, the COVID-19 pandemic has turned the world upside down. I believe it's an apt description of what was the impact of the pandemic. So needless to say, the impact of the pandemic did spread into every aspect of life, whether it is personal, social, economic or political. Every industry and sector, as we know, came to a standstill. So our legal sector had no exception. At the initial outbreak, the legal sector also came to a standstill. But uh, very soon, we were able to function to a limited extent, I would say, during the initial lockdown, during the quarantine curfew time period. Now, that was also possible thanks to the collaborative efforts of the relevant stakeholders, especially the Judicial Service Commission, the Ministry of Justice and the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Now, uh, I think it's important for us to observe where were we standing at the uh, point of the initial outbreak, how our legal sector was performing at that time. For that purpose, I would like to invite your attention to certain vital facts and figures that I came across this special report compiled by the Ministry of Justice. Now, the number of cases that were filed in the year 2019, now this is immediately before the COVID-19 outbreak struck us. The number of cases that were filed in the year 2019 is 977,100 cases, which is a little less than 1 million. Now, the number of cases that were concluded in the year 2019 is 908,700 cases. So that shows that our legal sector, before the COVID-19 pandemic, in the midst of other challenges, was performing fairly well with these numbers. Now, this is the number that concerns all of us, especially the litigants in the country the number of cases that were pending as of 31st December 2019 was 775,700 cases. Now this is where the main grievance is. Uh, the main grievance of the litigants is that these pending cases take a lot of time to get resolved. So at the uh, initial outbreak, before the initial outbreak, the relevant authorities were taking necessary steps, but were, were drawing up plans uh, with regard to addressing this concern, how to expedite the functioning of courts. So a lot of reforms, I would say, were, was in the pipeline 
when the COVID-19 pandemic strike uh, struck us. So uh, we were facing a challenge of expediting the functioning of courts and on top of that COVID-19 pandemic came. So uh, the challenge that was posed to the legal sector, I would say, was colossal. So Shirag, when you mentioned those figures for 2019, some of those cases that were resolved were also cases from previous years. Yes, of course. So, okay, so there was, there's a accumulated number that flows into 2020. And then, of course, we had closures, we had uh, times of lockdown where things weren't functioning as normal as they would have been expected. This was affecting all sectors. I mean, it affected the tourism sector very, very badly, uh, so many others. So obviously, the legal sectors also had a ma major challenge to deal with. How were these challenges overcome in terms of the challenges are there, but what measures were taken in order to evolve at that point and be able to deal with the situation? Well, I would say it was a combination of both short-term and long-term measures. Some measures were immediate measures, I would say, where the Judicial Service Commission, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the initial outbreak, issued multiple circulars that enabled the magistrate's court to entertain bail applications and other urgent applications that were supported by way of motion. And in the meantime, the litigants were able to uh, go to district courts. Now, this, this space was very limited, I would mm. say. But it was provided. The litigants were able to go to district courts for urgent applications, for instance, for like enjoining orders where grave and irreparable damage would have been caused. So that limited space was provided, especially by the circulars of the Judicial Service Commission. But as I again reiterate, this was very limited. However, the, the, the court system was functioning to a limited extent even. So we were not completely out of business. We were functioning to a certain extent, but due to, you may understand the pragmatic issues because the country was totally in a lockdown quarantine curfew was imposed and this was clearly this experience force new to us so uh, with that situation uh, the courts were functioning to that limit to a, to this certain extent and uh, those were the short term measures i would say when we speak about the long term measures basically the long term measures were brought by the covid-19 act number 17 of 2021 which I believe must be dealt in detail for the benefit of our viewers because it contains certain reliefs, certain provisions which are pertinent to the litigants. Absolutely, and we'll come back to that. When we return after the break, we're going to be looking at this new legislation that has been passed, what it has, what it entails, and what it means uh, for individuals, for Sri Lankans across the country. When we return on our next segment of the Sri Lankan Understanding. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. We're in conversation with Sharad Nilgiriya and we're talking about the functioning of the legal sector in the new normal of the pandemic times. Sharad, before the break, you made mention of legislation that came about in 2021, the COVID Act, as it is called. Could you tell us what it is all about, what it entails, because it has an impact on all of us. It was passed in Parliament, it's now the law. Uh, what does this entail? Yes, well, the COVID-19 Act number 17 of 2021 is a piece of legislation that we have enacted to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic situation. Now, as we know, other jurisdictions, for instance, England, Malaysia, those jurisdictions have also introduced, enacted these kind of acts. Our, in our context, the COVID-19 Act was enacted to serve three main purposes. It is mentioned clearly in the preamble of the Act as well. The three main purposes are to provide temporary provisions, uh, to provide relief to persons 
who were unable to comply with prescribed time periods set out in law mm. due to COVID-19 circumstances. And then to assign courts when a court is not able to function due to COVID-19 circumstances. And thirdly, to conduct court proceedings using remote communication technology. So those are the three main purposes we intend to fulfill through this legislation. So as I mentioned, the act was enacted on the 23rd of August 2021. However, the operative time period of the act is two years, commencing from the 1st March 2020 to 28th February 2022. The Minister of Justice has the authority to extend this act, the operative time period, for a further two years. But that is the maximum limit this act can be enforced. Now, I believe uh, it is important to us, especially the litigants, to uh, know more about how this act provides relief when they are unable to comply with these uh, prescribed time periods which are stipulated in law. Uh, now, George, we have uh, uh, rules and regulations that set out certain time limitations where certain steps must be taken, especially when to go to courts when a person is aggrieved. So the main piece of legislation is the prescription ordinance. The prescription ordinance stipulates time limitations for various types of actions. For instance, if it is relating breach of contract or a promissory note or a written promise, the litigant must go to court within six years from the date of the breach of contract. If it is an action on mortgage bond, the litigant must go to court within 10 years. If it is an action on sale of goods, the prescribed time period is one year. And if a person is intend to, intending to go to court for any loss or injury or damage caused, that person must go to court within two years. So these uh, time limitations are clearly stipulated. And in the normal routine, these time limitations are mandatory. The litigants must definitely meet these time limitations. However, as we understand, uh, due to the COVID-19 situation, there are lockdowns, there are quarantine curfews, there are travel restrictions. So there are many instances where the litigants were not able to meet these prescribed time periods. Now there, we have a relief through this act. That sort of a person must can, there's an ability to go to courts and show that the person was prevented from coming to court, from prevented uh, from uh, meeting this time limitation due to COVID-19 circumstance. Now, what does this COVID-19 circumstance mean? The act itself defines what is a COVID-19 circumstance. COVID-19 circumstance include COVID-19 itself and any circumstance that arise out of and consequential they are too. So it is very clear. And the burden of proof on proving that this person was uh, prevented from going to court because of a COVID-19 circumstance or is on the person who is relying on that provision. Mm. So, uh, and the other thing is that uh, any government guideline, uh, directive, order, circular that is in black and white or in digital form uh, is considered to be prima facie evidence in proving that a person was affected due to COVID-19 circumstance. So it is considered, this, uh, this piece of legislation is considered as a timely, uh, timely act to cope up with the uh, difficulties the litigants faced with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic situation. Absolutely. You mentioned out of those three stages as to why this was brought in, the third aspect you talked about was technology, usage of technology. Now, you said this also has a time frame. Now, it's good news to hear that legal systems have gone online. People can have their cases being heard online to a limited extent in certain courts. Now, would that cease after the deadline? 
No. Would we not see that becoming entrenched in the system? Isn't that a very positive step forward in using technology to go forward? Well, uh, I believe it, is, it was an overdue step, long overdue, I would say, uh, for us to go into the digital platform. Luckily and fortunately, I mean, the authorities are now uh, drawing up plans to digitalize the court system. And, uh, and there's another specialty in this COVID-19 Act, George, because this Act, prior to this Act, there was no legislation that provided provisions or facilitated digital hearings. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at the point of the COVID-19 outbreak, the initial outbreak, the authorities were drawing plans to digitalize the court proceedings because it was long overdue. However, then the COVID-19 pandemic struck us, which doubled the challenge we were facing. However, it showed us how important is this digital hearings. So the COVID-19 Act was focusing on this, the specific act we discussed was focusing on to, especially to cope with these uh, time limitations where the litigants were not able to go to court uh, in time, on time, I would say. So, uh, but in the meantime, the Act provided much needed provisions for the introduction of uh, digital hearings, especially for the original courts. Original courts in the sense the magistrate courts and the district courts. So it is, even though it is a long due uh, introduction, I would say it is paradigm shifting to us in this era to uh, digitalize our courts in that way. So I think uh, the Although the COVID-19 Act has a limit in its operative time period, the legislature will definitely uh, facilitate the digitalization of court system in the time to come. Excellent, because that's what we need. And I want to come back in the next segment and talk about where, we, where other countries are going in the future, what they are looking at, how they are dealing with similar situations. When we return on the next segment of the Sri Lankan understanding, we'll explore the international ramifications, how COVID has impacted the legal fraternity around the world. When we come back on our next segment of the Sri Lankan understanding. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. Sharad, before we went to the break, you told us about the COVID-19 Act. You told us what legislation we've taken in Sri Lanka to meet this new development in the country. If we go overseas and we look at international developments with regard to systems, how they're dealing with COVID-19, uh, what action is being taken? Well, from the inception of the pandemic, we have seen in the international forum this ongoing debate about whether to make vaccination mandatory. I have seen some media, certain media uh, describing this as the conundrum of compulsion versus persuasion because certain countries have made it mandatory, the vaccination, and some countries have not. Uh, now, if we take certain examples, for instance, uh, President Joe Biden's administration in the US uh, during mid-2021 uh, made it mandatory for the federal workers and federal contractors and also uh, healthcare workers who were funded by the federal government to show proof of vaccination without giving them the option of testing, which essentially inadvertently uh, mandatorily making, uh, making the vaccination mandatory. Now, on the on the same time period, uh, France and Greece made COVID-19 vaccination mandatory for their frontline health workers. In Brazil, the Brazilian Supreme Court made a ruling stating that the local governments are able to make vaccination mandatory. However, in England, a different approach has been taken where the UK government is more preferring educating the people and persuading them to get the vaccination through informed consent. Mind you, this is when one third of their uh, care home workers 
have declined to take the vaccination. Still, they are not pushing or making it compulsory for the vaccination to be taken. In, in Australia, as you would have seen, they have a strong policy with regard to vaccination. We, they have worded it uh, as no jab, no pay policy, where certain people are restricted of getting certain tax reliefs if their children are not vaccinated. If we take the, if we take India, the closest jurisdiction, there is a Supreme Court case pending with regard to whether to make vaccination mandatory or not, namely Evara Foundation versus Union of India. So the judgment is pending. So in Sri Lanka also we are having this discussion whether to make the vaccination card mandatory when we go into public places, but there is no conclusion yet. So we see even in the international arena, there is no general or global consensus with regard to making vaccination mandatory. My personal belief is that uh, the most important fact is to meet that precious balance between curbing the spread of the pandemic whilst ensuring personal liberty and human rights. When we look to the future, when we look ahead, Sharag, from where we are right now, things are changing very drastically. Things have changed in the last two years. We probably had to make a massive leap into the future from so many angles. Where do you see the legal sector going? How do you see these things evolving? You said the technology aspect has now come in. This was in many countries already. We were probably late in coming on board there, but at least we've done it, which is great. We've made a stride, we've made a step, and that's a very positive one. Where do you see the sector going in the years ahead? Well, speaking about the future of our legal sector, as a country with rich legal history, uh, I believe that we must first learn from our past, learn from our history, uh, learn from the ideals enshrined in our history, because history is not merely a path to the past, it influences the present and can shape the future. And also, uh, the, the, our approach towards the future of our legal sector must be an individual responsibility focused approach as well as a collective approach, I would say. When I speak about the individual responsibility, Justice Surya Kant, who is supposed to be the next Chief Justice in India, in a recent judgment has stated that lawyers are not merely professionals who represent their clients. Lawyers are social engineers. What does this mean? I think that statement applies to every lawyer, even the Sri Lankan lawyers. In my opinion, a lawyer is burdened with a special duty that goes beyond the obligation, professional obligation, to assist the administration of justice and to uphold the rule of law. So I believe that every lawyer has to be a social engineer, Every lawyer has to be a change maker and every lawyer has to be a proponent of justice. Now that is the individual responsibility of us, the legal practitioners in this, uh, in this journey towards the future. Speaking about collective effort, the collaborative efforts of the institutional stakeholders are of great importance. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the relevant authorities were drawing up plans you know, to expedite the uh, court's functioning, expedi uh, digitalize the courts, and numerous other uh, steps had been taken, introducing new courthouses, increasing the number of judicial officers, infrastructure development, uh, then uh, legal reforms, like uh, uh, still these legal reforms are in the pipeline and it will be enforced in the in the coming future, I believe. Uh, new courthouses, uh, we call them as uh, pretrial courthouses and small claim courts. Do you know to expedite the mm. uh, functioning, of, uh, functioning of courts to deal with the large number of pending cases? So things are happening, things are moving, things are moving. Fortunately, even in the midst of the challenge of COVID-19. So I believe that uh, the Sri Lankan legal sector's future 
would be better, effective and efficient. Abraham Lincoln once observed that you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. So I believe that we must act proactively, collectively and diligently to take our legal sector to greater heights. Absolutely and that's a very important point where you mentioned there uh, you talked about the legal sector being social engineers or lawyers being social engineers in terms of safeguarding the law but also uh, the role of law in society but also individual freedoms, individual liberties. Thank you very much for taking time to join us on the Sri Lankan understanding as we focused on a very timely area looking at the functioning of the legal sector in the new normal. Where are we going from here forward? What has been the measures that have been taken so far and what potential is there as we go ahead into the future? And that wraps up another segment of the Sri Lankan Understanding. Join us again next time when we focus on various aspects of Sri Lanka and I don't in the Indian Ocean.